I think at this point, uh, considering there's some misunderstanding and uh, we have our guests here on time, though, as a courtesy to them, yes, I think we should start. So may I ask the uh, call the meeting to order? Today is October 7th, 6 p.m. for the meeting of the Finance Committee of Wareham. May I ask the clerk call the roll, please? We have uh, Bernie, Chairman Bernie Pigeon, Vice Chair David Hart, Stuart Novak, Glenn Lawrence and myself, Jerry Stefanski. Did I did I miss anyone? Don't believe so. Okay, so that's five, and we so we have a quorum. Good. Uh, Mary Bruce will be joining us, and she's probably waiting till six o'clock. Uh, I have spoken with her, and she did a presentation last night at the selectmen's meeting. So hopefully, we'll see her uh, here also. I'm here, Bernie. Oh, wow, very good. Welcome, Mary. Uh, so why don't we start with you, and uh, I think there's some questions with respect that uh, the NIPs, and the NIPs were actually being talked about on Howie Carr yesterday, and, and most of the information that we have or we're requesting is, do you have any financial data that goes along with your request? We do not. <laughs> You, was there any data available to other communities who've uh, done the same thing? No. It, I don't believe so. Uh huh. So why do you, why should we be approving this? Um, I would highly doubt that uh, liquor sales are going to go down for any reason at all. Um, and this is this is. Um, purely an anti-littering thing right now. Like I said last night at the meeting, there's been lots of collateral good that has happened in the other community that they're reporting so far from banning NIPs. But um, I really, I mean, if, if liquor sales go down, that's a good thing. I don't think that's a bad thing. I'm not concerned about that. <laughs> well, as, uh, as far as the littering is concerned, I know uh, if I might ask Alan, uh, she and Sandy are part of the cleanup and they periodically go through this process. Alan, how many bottles or NIP containers do you find in your cleanup? I don't have enough uh, fingers and toes to count anymore. Really? Actually, you should ask Mary. I believe a couple of years ago, she came in with two uh, probably 60 gallon uh, trash bags full of NIPs for one area or all. Uh, yes, and foot, from the Gary. presentation last night as well as, you know, what it's going to cost us to be picking up trash anymore, this stuff isn't recyclable. If it's thrown out on the street, if it's run over, contaminated with gas, oil, you can't recycle them. These are just tossed out everywhere. Um, you know, they've tried the, they've tried bottle bills and tried deposits and stuff. It just isn't working. Mary, do you have any awareness of uh, up here on Main Street in West Wareham? The, uh, it appeared in the Wareham Weekly, as a matter of fact, as a, pic, as a photo. There's a barrel with a sign for a NIP target. Oh, Tom. <laughs> oh yeah, it's on Main Street. I've yes. seen it. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Uh, have you been in touch with those people to see how successful they're uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I haven't. The front yard has a very interesting amount of stuff laying on it. Um. It's not just NIP bottles, anything possible being thrown at it. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> um, that's Bernie. No, maybe Judy. Thank you. There's actually a, a couple that walks every day on Main Street. Uh, there's four of them, and they take a bag with them, and they pick up everything from Galt Road down Paper Mill Road. They come around um, and come back out on Main Street. So they've been picking up a lot of. A lot of nip bottles up this way and, and trash, and they go every single day. Yep. Yes, I've seen them out there. I live right, right around the corner. Excuse me, Bernie. Yes. Tom Wortham would like to get in, but he gets a note that says the host has to let him in. I don't know why. Uh, that, I believe, would be uh, Steve. Uh, typically, I don't, I'm not aware of, but typically. No, I don't understand it either. Maybe Steve can let him in. All right, back back to the discussion, excuse me. Yeah, does anybody have any questions of me? Who's here? 
Yeah, I have a question. Um, Mary, any of the surrounding towns have a ban on nip bottles? No, not yet. Okay, now I just, uh, you know, uh, for, for, for thinking about waiting for those to let them in. So nobody has a, a ban on uh, nip bottles yet. Idea. The community is contiguous to us, Barry. Thank you. I can answer that if you'd like. Yes, please, Alan. Uh, I've talked to Rochester, to Marion, uh, Middleborough, uh, Bourne. Uh, those four towns all are waiting to see if we pass ours, and they will either get theirs done this fall if they have the time, or if not, it'll be in the spring. They want to see if it actually holds. Uh, they didn't realize that the ABCC had okay Chelsea when it was challenged a, a week ago. The ABCC ruled in favor of Chelsea because it was a law. We can't do, you know, just so everybody understands, we cannot as a single town or any town put a deposit on bottles. It has to come from the state. So our only option as far as trying to control litter at this point here is strictly as a uh, non-sale. Just continuing the sale of the uh, bottles, okay. Yeah, because the bottle bill controls that and that's a state individual towns cannot do that. Mm -hmm. Mary, are you aware of that process that the uh, we would have to go through if we pass this? Yes. We don't actually have to do anything. We pass it from the bylaw and unless it's challenged and it will go to the ABCC and they'll basically rule in our favor. It doesn't require anything from us at all except town meeting saying okay. okay. I'm under the assumption it's not going to be challenged anymore, so we'll we'll just have to see. And I'll, if I can um, remind everyone, the first year we did the town cleanup, like the massive town cleanup, we actually had CMAS weigh our dumpsters before and after, and we picked up almost two tons of trash off the side of the road. Um. So with our our new uh, refuse <laughs> costs and everything, that's certainly it's going to cost something to get rid of this stuff. Indeed. Any other questions, gentlemen, ladies? Okay, Jody has joined us. Good evening. Any other questions, gentlemen and ladies? Anything you wish to add, Mary? Um, not at this time. I think we covered it. Okay. Then thank you very much. Appreciate your coming in and joining us. Thank you. Hey, for the record, both Jody and Tom Warden have joined us. Very good. Do you have, uh, I have Pat's name up, but I don't, uh, I'm not sure she's connected. Doesn't appear, appear to be. Okay, D is Gary. Ah, oh, you're sitting in your truck, huh? Hi, how are you? Yeah, I'm actually watching this uh, sunset slash thunderstorm coming through uh, off of Tempest Knob. It's pretty wild. So, uh, anyway, you want to go through uh, 14? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, so we have a 27 foot Boston whaler. Uh, that was the patrol boat that we received through the Homeland Security grant. The motors are 10 years old on it. They're uh, twin 300 horsepower. Verado engines. Um, both are V6 engines. They've got superchargers. Um, the, basically, we were looking to do from controls all the way back to motors as well as steering. Um, it's a it's our primary patrol boat. It runs to a majority of the calls that we have. Um, so I think we're hovering around probably 2,000 hours on these motors. Uh, we did lose one powerhead last year, um, and we were intending on replacing the motors, but I think now is the time to do it because at least we're going to try and get some kind of trade-in value with these motors since they are running. Um, they, they tend to have uh, seeping um, seals and whatnot in the, the cylinder heads from what the uh, mechanics are telling us. And now we're, they're starting to throw codes. So that's kind of a sign of we're having some deteriorating problems and they've served us well. I mean, the, the, this boat essentially goes to, almost everything that we deal with. Um, it's, 
the bigger of the two boats. Um, we'd be looking to go to a V8 style, a V8 uh, outboard engine is, instead of the V6s to try and eliminate the supercharger and all the extra like, fun, expensive components. Uh, and the V8 gives us actually more torque, less weight, and that's just a simpler motor to work on from what uh, we've been explained to you by the mechanics. Um, we'll, we'll probably come in a lot lower, I think, on our monies. I, I ha we have to go out to bid, um, and I'm, I'm hoping that with the savings from the municipal programs that some of the motor, um, the motor manufacturers offer us, Boston Whaler likes to use Mercury. Obviously, they're owned by Brunswick, both of them. So they try to steer their boats to specifically using their products. Um, so hopefully we come in with, you know, a comparable motor that, um, you know, we've already got holes cut in places where their components will just plug right back in and they won't have to do a lot of modifications. Um, and, I, you know, we, we have had good luck with the Mercury. Uh, some people haven't. We have. Um, so we're, we're just looking at time to these motors upgraded. So I'm hoping to come in with, with a trade in value of these motors going towards the purchase and then through the savings that we'll, we'll hopefully get through, um, the, the, the savings of, um, Brunswick and the different uh, manufacturers will, I'm hoping to come in a lot lower than we anticipate. So, um, and then the, obviously the second uh, portion of that is the uh, onset pier docks. That's just this will be the second second payment of of the borrowing for the replacement of the docks here. Any, any questions of Gary? Uh, uh, Ga Gary, how many hours did you say I around those engines around, approximately? I, I think we're hovering around two thousand hours. Okay. And don't forget, I mean, we got a lot of idling time, a lot of low, you know, the motors are under strain all the time. They're, they're, it's, it's not like a normal boat operating. It's kind of like a police car with just, um, you know, a lot more wear and tear. So. Yep. Anything else, gentlemen? Hi. Jody? Yep. Uh, yeah, can, can you just give me an idea? What's your best guess as far as money goes? And, and I'm not going to hold you to anything. I understand going out for bid and all that. You know, right now we we look at both the 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 what you're normally buying the motors at, um, and what we're also going to get at the savings of of being a, a municipality. What they offer us, I'm I'm thinking we're going to hover around. 17, 18,000 per motor, and that doesn't include uh, gauges, um, ignitions, um, controls, steering. So I, I think with trade in everything, I'm hoping, hoping, fingers crossed, uh, that we come in around 45. But we're we're uh, we're just going to err on the side of caution and go a little bit higher, so we know where we're coming in at. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I saw you know, the selectman talking about the costs and stuff. I just didn't know if there was anything else that's come up. The other yeah. question is, I know boat boat engines are a little different. They don't do they show up on the state bid list? It's not so much a state. Uh, it's not so much a state bid list. Um, it's it's more of purchasing with their programs that they offer. Right. So yeah. Yeah. We get the GSA pricing, which will be good. So I'm hoping that whoever comes in, some are more, some are less. Mercury always seems to have a really good program. So I think we're gonna, I think you're we're gonna end up seeing Mercury, um, and they do offer a, a pretty significant savings. I mean, if you or I were gonna to go into a dealership and buy a 300 V8. Verado, I think we'd be looking at 26, 27,000. Yeah. Um, and if we can come in at 17, 18, 16, uh, usually the counter rotating motor is more money. Um, it'll be pretty good. But the, you know, the boat already came equipped with electronic controls. It's got the, the computer mechanism in it. It's got a lot of stuff going on with it. So we just, it's essentially take it all out and put it all back in and off and running. So I'm, I'm hoping yeah. Like I said, fingers crossed that we're going to drive that price right down. Yeah. And just a little follow-up. So this is just me being nosy. It's an operational thing. Just oh, bear with cool. me for one second. So I see the onset five boat packed down there. If you had a real emergency, something that all hell broke loose, you guys have the opportunity to get in that and go out um, for a rescue or whatever? 
I'm just curious. As a as a professional courtesy, no, I would not take Onsen Fire's boat. Why don't um, you have a working agreement? Yeah, no, sort? we don't we don't we don't cross too much on it. We okay. do usually take them on board. Um, and we have trained Onset Fire to utilize our, our equipment. Um, but as a courtesy, if we're going to run somebody from the, ver the, the opposite department. <coughs> yeah, I, I'm just curious if, you know, something drastic happened and, you know, that's all. Thank you. That's yeah, all. no, I, I, trust me, I get it. We, with the smaller boats, you know, with the smaller boats, we've always had an agreement that, you know, they can jump on and take them. But when you start putting somebody that doesn't, work on the waterway all the time and you throw them in a 30 plus foot boat uh it, you know yeah. I, I i think they can be a lot of problems with it so. yeah yeah hopefully it's never needed but just say something really drastic happened you know no, you, ne you never know we do have a really good working relationship with them they you know the, the fire departments they, they they do step up they're out all the time with us yeah. and it, and it yeah. works so they it's it's nice to have a you know when you, we start looking at our boats i mean you can't drive an ambulance. You can't drive a police car. You can't bring a fire truck to where we're at. So our platform is 31 feet by 10 feet wide. And when a second one shows up, now we double our platform. So, you know, we have to build our safety platform out there and then and go from there. Whereas, you know, you can't shut down a road and just walk away. So right, it's, right. Yeah. It's, a, yeah. It's, it's always interesting for sure. Yeah, I'm just curious. Thank you. Oh, I'm gl glad to answer it. Any other questions of Gary? No, but as long as you're not offering free rides, I guess no one has a question. <laughs> in the spring, in the spring, we'll show you what you bought. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Got it. Thank you. You guys have a great time. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Take Thanks, care. Gary. Thanks for your efforts, Gary. I hope you guys have a good night. You also. Bye-bye. The next on our list would be the uh, WPCF, who is asking for $9 million. My gosh, does it cost that much to flush these days? Oh, you got to pay for the vacations for us. <laughs> Two commissioners need something. Okay, uh, you're on, gentlemen. I uh, appreciate if you would uh, review just what you're going to do with this. This, uh, Some of this was requested on a previous town meeting, wasn't it? Our fall town meeting? I, I would suggest that Russ take the lead here. Yes. Um, yeah. We've bought this in front of the town meeting last year, and um, we've done pieces of this, and we're continuing on. So I think Russ can speak specifically to the $9 million that we um, are asking to authorize through the SIF funding to complete some projects we have at the facility. Okay, Russ, welcome. Are you Hi, good evening. Good evening. I, first of all, everyone can hear me okay? Yes. Yep. So anyone right. have a problem? Oh, you're on. Thank you. Um, just for the record, my name is Russ Kleekamp. I'm an engineer with the company GHD, and we're working closely with the Water Pollution Control Facility. Um, and what we're discussing tonight is the request for the uh, $9 million through the state revolving fund. Um, and this is for needed upgrades at the wastewater treatment plant. So let me explain those. Um, there's two major upgrades we're looking at. It's the addition uh, additional denitrification filters. What these are, are um, towards the end of the process, it's a filter that does the polishing and the final removal of nitrogen. Um, current standards for wastewater treatment plants require uh, what they call redundant filters. So if your main filter bank either gets clogged or it has to go offline, you have a supplemental filter bank to run the flow through, um, which right now the, the, the facility does not have a redundant filter bank. Um, so what happens when we get the high flows from I and I and things like that is a higher flow moves through the plant with a, with a stronger flow, a faster flow, your solids don't settle out. So just think of it like standing by a, a slow moving stream. If you throw a handful of dirt in there, that settles very quickly, but a fast moving stream, you throw the dirt in there, it just keeps getting carried on downstream. So when we have these higher flows at the plant, the solids don't settle out and it ends up clogging the filters. The filters have to be taken offline um, and it results in a, bypass and equalization lagoons. Um, so why that's a concern now is that we're in drought conditions is that once these conditions um, reverse and we get higher groundwater levels, things like that, the equalization lagoons now are gonna start to fill up. So we won't have a place to bypass to. And in the past, what happened is 
uh, the treatment facility has to do a non-permitted diversion, meaning they have to discharge flow to an unlined area on the treatment plant grounds, which technically is in violation of the permit. So um, this is something that DEP uh, would likely require the town to do anyways in the future, uh, but being proactive, uh, we recognize this as an item that needs to be addressed now. So that's one of the components is to add an additional redundant denitr denitrification filter bank to the treatment facility. Um, we're estimating that in, in the $2 million range. And then the second project is the odor control. There's been, um, for as long as I've been working for the town for eight years, and I think beyond that, there's always been uh, issues with odors at the plant, and partially because they have two large, these two large equalization lagoons that store raw wastewater. So it's very challenging to control odors when you have open source of, of raw wastewater. In the case of the treatment facilities, you have two acres, up to two acres of surface area. Uh, so what we're, we're looking to do with the remaining funds is to, in, to come up with odor control. Um, that can be done through a few different ways, um, either covering the existing lagoons, um, adding in a primary lagoon for solid settling, um, but we expect that to take up the bulk of the remainder uh, of the $7 million. It's not cheap to cover the, the lagoons, um, but it's, it's something that needs to be done. So that's the, where the $9 million is coming from. We, early on, we had a third project in there, which was to install additional equalization lagoons. However, that was pulled out, I believe that's being paid through retained earnings because that was needed sooner than later to help combat the high INI issue. That was approved in the fall 2019 town meeting. And then what was approved in the 2020 town meeting was the $2 million for the denitrification filter. So I believe in the town meeting coming up, what we're asking for is to authorize spending up to $9 million. We're not saying 9 million total, but up to 9 million. Um, and barring that through the SRF, uh, SRF program. Very good. Any questions, gentlemen? Hello. Yes. Question. Um, this plan. About, about nine million. My nine Zoom million. meeting started later than it should have. Uh, can I meet you at seven thirty? All right. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, we had the nine logging on and didn't work out quite the way it was supposed to. So, thank you very much. I'll see you at seven thirty. I'll be there, even if I have to leave this meeting fast early. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. The nine million dollars minus two million for the, the denitrification leaves seven right. million. That seven million for order control. That my understanding is that what you're the seven million would be for or, strictly for order control. Up to seven million for so order control. So correct. The, right. So of the nine million, there's just two projects. Two million for the denitrification. And seven million for the for order control. I, I want to be clear that the two million for the denitrification filters is a best estimate. The numbers have been hard and fast because another whole bank has to be purchased to incorporate into the present system. So when we talked about this last year, we estimated two million. Uh, part of the evaluation process of the plant was to put hard numbers on that. That evaluation has not happened. It's beginning now. So we'd stick with that two million, but that could be a little less, a little more, and, and we're not 100% sure. Covering of the basins is totally unknown. We looked in the past to cover the basins, the actual two million, and at the price we got back in the, I'm gonna say around 2014, was upwards of $5 million, $6 million. We don't know what it's going to be today. We're also looking at a smaller size basin that we can reduce the size and capture the solids and then process the solids. So what we're saying is that the nine million is a number we'd like to be authorized. When it comes to the actual borrowing and filling out of the paperwork at the time of the loan, that number will be hard and fast. It will definitely be, or should be less than $9 million, but it cannot be more than $9 million. At that time, we'll get a hard, fast number that we'll actually borrow, and we'll do that through John Foster. Now, the odor control is essentially covering the two existing lagoons? Yes, it would either be covering the existing lagoons or it would be creating another lagoon. We're not so sure, but whatever has to ha whatever happens, it has to be enclosed, covered, and then there has to be some type of air removal, and then that air has to be treated. Uh, we've tried just about everything under the sun to handle the open lagoons. Um, it is very difficult because flows are sporadic, and flows throughout the town of Warham. Some are very odorous. 
and more so than others. And um, we can't control it. We've used tons of, spent tons of money on chemicals. We tried other approaches, and nothing has any great success. And covering of them would give us a great mitigation opportunity. At one time, there was talk of a third lagoon open and online. Is that off the table now? The open, the third lagoon open online is be actually we're at contract, waiting for the contracts to be executed. That's lagoons three and four, and that'll be specifically for the back end of the plant, which will be secondary processed, and we will not have the raw sewer odors that are that associated with that. So we know that if we can divert to the to the uh, back lagoons, um, that'll help with the odors. It won't eliminate them or won't mitigate them as much as we'd like to. So we um, are looking. To Again, to do something in the front end because that's our major source. Raw sewer is, uh, it's just not pleasant. Yeah, so that th the third lagoon is still on, on process then? It is. Actually, we're at contract. They put the silt fence up today. Uh, we're just waiting for the contract to be executed so we can start in your really wide open and get it done. Excellent. Excellent. And so the, uh, the, the amount of money as you're talking about, the uh, about the seven mil, would be just for the covering. Yeah. Anything additional added to those two lagoons in addition to the covering? The cover will be for the raw only. The back lagoons won't be covered. Again, they're dealing with a secondary process or secondary product, which removes all the, if you will, the very odorous, the hydrogen sulfides and the mercaptans and things of that sort that become very odorous. That in the back end of the plant after it's been through aeration, filtration, uh, and, and clarification, it has a, a, um, an odor that is less offensive. Thank you. If, if I could just add a couple things to that guy. Um, the lagoons we're building, the lagoons we're building now in the back end, um, we don't expect to use those very frequently. They're for these extreme storm events. Um, but however, since there is a known condition at the plant where there have been non-permitted discharges, it's something that needs to be addressed um, ASAP. When it comes to the covering of uh, or the odor control. And that's, uh, I know it sounds seven million for odor control. I know that's the initial reaction is, wow, that's a lot of money. Uh, Guy is 100% right. Not only do we have to cover the existing lagoons, but you also have to capture and treat that air. So when, you, when you're talking about the cover, since we have a one acre lagoon, if you were to do a flat cover, it has to be much more structurally rigid because you have to account for snow loads, things like that. But the benefit is you have less air you need to capture. You can do a domed cover that has to be less structurally strong um, because it sheets off the snow and the, the elements better, but then you have more air that needs to be traded. So it's, it's, it's a trade-off. We have to evaluate the different covering systems and really determine what's in the best interest for the town. Um, and again, it's, it's borrowing. We asked the EP to allocate $9 million for this. It doesn't, we're going to spend it all. Um, and within the next month or two, we're going to be finished with our, our evaluation and we'll have a much more finite number to work with. Um, but given the timelines, this application is due um, on October 15th, we have to submit it. Um, and then we have to submit a supplement to that application at some point in January, February with the more defined numbers. The dome coverings I, that you mentioned, I'm familiar with. I had a friend who's uh, in a business of, uh, let's see, the company was called Coverall. In fact, they did the uh, mm -hmm. practice field for uh, the Patriots, but I'm familiar with that style of building and it is a very sturdy building in respect of how flimsy it can look. No, and, and, I, and the other thing, and they're not they're not cheap. And and the other thing is we have to really concern ourselves with moving all that air. So the larger the space, the more air we have to move. Because remember, we're still going to get off gassing from those lagoons from the basins. And so that means that we have to treat that air. And, and, and again, because it, it, in theory, if the air keeps giving off an off gas and has no place to go, it can be very dangerous. Good. Well, I was just lastly, was... I'll add. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I'd say the other thing with the lagoons is they, they also have to be retractable and being able to open for maintenance purposes. So that's the other challenge with this is we have to find some sort of covering system. If we do decide, that could be one of the major determinations in whether or not we look at an additional uh, settling lagoon um, or if we can find a suitable covering system that's also retractable um, so we can get in and maintain. You can't just cover it and then not go in there and maintain it and clean it out. So it's, a, it's, a comp it's, it's definitely doable, um, but there's several... Uh, steps that have to be taken under consideration. 
And that's very valid. The lagoons we have now are very difficult to clean. What we're installing in the back end, what little solids we'll get, is being designed to center those uh, so we can remove them very easily. Not only do we have the odors as the solids settle out, we can't chase them. And they become very odorous in themselves as they decompose. Guy, or when was the last time this system, the uh, system was upgraded, a major upgrade? What system are you speaking of specifically, the basins? Yes, the whole, the whole, the whole plant. Uh, 2005, it went online. So that means that in 1998, 1999, the design was done, and all the components of this plant were done around 1998. So when we talk about 2005, you're talking 15 years, you add the design factor, and a lot of things are purchased at design. We've got products in the plant that were antiquated the day the, pro the plant went online. So it needs to be addressed uh, very seriously. As, as an example, uh, as we speak, our SCADA system is down. We've got rotted wires, we've got electrical strike, and we can't control the, in well, we can't see the incoming flow. So we can't control our, our equalizing basin, we can't control our pumps. Um, so we're in this mad rush to get it repaired. We've got coaxial people coming in, we've got um, you know, a lot, bunch of people coming in trying to figure this out. And we believe when we're done, just to get back online, we're gonna spend the upwards of 40 grand. So the, the, I think when people think of the plant, they say it's new. That plant is far from new. Wiring is good for 15 years because of the, of the environment that we're in. So there's going to need to be a major overhaul. These clarifiers were antiquated the day we put them in. They were too shallow. We, we, uh, and so they've been around since 1970. They're very ineffective. Uh, they don't do a good job of setting out solids. Um, aeration basins need to be so there's a lot of things that uh, we'd have to look at in that plan evaluation so nonetheless moving forward there's going to going to have to be a lot of things done at the plant to meet the current needs um, and and the flow rates that we're getting my impression is overall a major upgrade is in the works uh, this piecemeal that you're doing is more or less maintaining what you're uh, what you have to do now, and when you consider the 1970 and what the capacity is expected of that system now, two totally different things, and we're not we're not capable of doing it as you currently said. I, I agree, and and we try to do it as we go along, as funds are available. Every time you do something like that, you got to come back and redo, and it becomes very expensive. So piece building is really not the way to go, but. Again, we all know economics dictates how we do things and what we can accomplish. Um, yes, uh, we still have, I would suggest that 80% of that plant um, around that number is still 1972 vintage. Uh, I've got tank structures that are definitely deteriorated, flood holding tanks and, you know, and, and equalizing basins. I'm talking about specifically the, the aeration basins. We got two that are, that are 1970 technology, um, clarifiers that are 1970. We got drums that we concern ourselves with. So yes, it goes on and on and on. Um, and, and I just want the town to be aware that, you know, these things are not inexpensive, but they're needed because as the sewer grows, um, it's the growth of the community. And I think you're, you're constantly trying to um, maintain a level that meets the requirements of the, the agencies that are imposing on us. Yes, um, the, the, agencies, the EPA and the DP, um, their rules and regulations is something that we have to live by. We have a net boost permit that's very specific as to what I can put in that river for flow, um, you know, nutrients. Uh, you know, BOD, et cetera, et cetera, so it's a very stringent permit. I got to say, the guys do a great job. I mean, uh, being understaffed and, and all the problems we have, the guys are meeting our permit. We've met on nitrogen permit consistently, uh, actually, half of what's required of us. Um, right now we have a phosphorus level. We're taking phosphates in at the plant at 17 to 65 parts per million, or four to eight is normal throughout the country. So, somewhere in the town, we're getting tremendous amounts of phosphates in. We're spending tons of money on chemicals just to treat it, just to precipitate it out so I can make permit, which is 0.2 pots per million. You think of 0.2 pots per million, it's gotta go in the river and 65 pots coming in, which is you know tremendously over the, non, the, the, the norm that we see normally, we see six to seven. Um, and again, we don't know where that's coming from. It could be COVID related, it could not be, it could be an industry that we don't know about. And uh, we have a proposal now to get some testing at the headworks, uh, right Pierce to do some evaluations of what's coming at us so we can chase this back. Someone's given us a whole lot of phosphates 
and it's really rocking our world. So, um, yeah, the regulators should make sure that uh, we don't exceed those levels that go to the river, and we have to get to that level. Everything up front of it is the issue that we have to deal with on a daily basis. Thank you. Any question? Any more questions? I got one comment, Bernie. Yes, sir. Yes. The only thing is, if we want to, if we want the town of Wareham to continue to grow, we're going to have to do the work that's required at the water pollution control facility. Everybody wants to hook in, and we have no place to go unless we start improving the, what we have to work with. And Jim, do you have the numbers on paper of the capacity of the commitments that system has already made and the capacity of the system? I don't have the I'm sorry, Jim. Go ahead. He yeah. does. And we'll speak. But I, I just want to say, on his behalf, he'll be discussing those tomorrow night, I believe Thursday night I meet, and we're going, to, we're going to evaluate and discuss all of that. So if you can tune in tomorrow night, I think Jim will have a, a lot of great answers for you. And if I don't have an answer, I'll make up a story. <laughs> Any other questions? Jody? You know, assuming this passes a town meeting, which I don't see why it wouldn't, what's your, what's your wish? I'm just dealing with the older part, think of the residents up there. What's your best wish to hopefully have that completed? A year, two years? I mean, a couple I don't of years, anyways. I mean, because once you get it funded, then you design, then you move forward, and yeah. a couple of years before it come to fruition uh, in that in the in that two year process, it'll be worked on. And, and I'm saying two years, it should be online. Yeah, I figured about two years, but. Thank you. Russ, do you have anything you want to add? No, thank you. Just uh, thanks for having me uh, having me talk tonight. I appreciate it. Appreciate your input. Yep. Thank you. Uh, is there any more questions? There being none, Jim. Guys, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for thank having you me. for inviting us. All right, guys, have a thank pleasure. Thank you. Uh, be safe out there. The wind's starting to pick up, so gentlemen and and ladies, please be safe. Thank you. Have a have a fun night. <laughs> thank you, Jim. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ken is there, and I was wondering, um, as long as he's here, is there any questions you may have of him regarding uh, the zoning change as well as the master plan? Well, I, I know they're going to discuss the height at a meeting. Is that still going to be the 50 feet with... 65 feet with special, you know, special permitting. That's correct. Okay, is there any other questions? No, well, Ken, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next one I, I wanna call on is Judy. And I know I've sat down with the uh, changes and tried to go through them each time to understand. The only difficulty um, is the expectation of the format of the changes insofar as typically we have the, uh, let's say a page of paragraphs changed, the paragraph is lined out and it's followed by the corrected paragraph. And going from one document to another uh, was a little uh, difficulty and time consuming for sure. Uh, but <clears throat> that's the presentation that the group decided to do. And do you have any questions of Judy and the changes that they suggestion? I assume everybody's gone the same thing I have, of course. <laughs> but Judy, has there, uh, have you countered any objections to the changes in, well, I'll start with chart uh, one which is mostly capitalization, punctuation, sentence structure, but the one critical change is changing the, the board of selectmen to select board. How has that been accepted by other people other than the select men themselves? Um, only one person has objected to it and he's called himself a dinosaur and no one else, to my knowledge, has, you know, publicly said, no, they're not going to go along with it. It's clearly, um, in today's world, the, the 
uh, neutral, neutral gendering of language is something that is a hot topic and needs to be done. Um, a third, well, Alan had given a statistic last night, Mr. Slavin had given a statistic last night that um, despite the fact that uh, previously the state and others had sort of balked at going from board of selectmen to select board, the feeling has changed. So no, there have been no objections other than one individual and that's it. <laughs> well, I'm with the dinosaur. I'm a traditionalist. Um, I don't have uh, give any credibility to the gender issue at all. I think a person, if they have a title, the fact that the men may be in the title is irrelevant. I look at the person and they happen to have a title of grand poopa or whatever. Uh, but that's my issue on uh, chart one is the changing. I just prefer the board of selectmen uh, from the little town I grew up in in Cheshire where we had more cows and people. It was board of selectmen and I'm just a traditionalist. Is there any other comment on that particular issue? <laughs> Before we move on, Alan, you want to say something? Uh, the Massachusetts uh, Municipal Association, which represents all 351 communities in Massachusetts, has a another option group, which is called the Mass Selectmen's Association. Uh, last winter, there was discussion about changing the name to the Mass Select Board Association. Now, this particular group represents all selectmen in those towns that have a selectman type of, you know, town meeting, et cetera. And the regions uh, that we have represented, I represent region four, which is Plymouth County, Cape and the Islands. Uh, I was the only one out of the five of us that still was a uh, mass select one. Uh, so I guess I'll now, if this goes through, be with the rest of the group. So the bottom answer is that uh, the Mass Selectmen's Association has basically condoned the change. The only issue that we're going to have, which I don't think the state's ever going to do, is and Mass General Law is going to continue to refer to uh, selectmen as selectmen. They really don't show any, uh, I don't see any way we're going to change that part of it. But I have no problem as far as I'm concerned. And the Mass Select Board Association is obviously in, in line with this as well now. This is all very interesting, but I don't think there's any financial implications to this change, is there? No. Okay. No, unless you have to buy new letterhead and stuff like that. <laughs> okay. We'll use up the I old. Think, I can understand Seward's implication in that, that, that uh, coming before the finance committee, uh, but they're looking for a recommendation and, and uh, in the new, the new language, at least as I interpret it, everything is very specific before we could uh, we had a choice. We considered all moneyed articles and everything else was at our discretion. I believe the new language is that everything comes before the finance committee. Okay. And that would be in chart two. Any other questions on chart one? Can I just hold up an example of the old and the new so that you can actually see the difference. If you went through that line item thing, you probably wanted to poke your eyes out. <laughs> this, is, this is the old way the charter looked. Uh -huh. Lots of run on paragraphs and stuff. This is the new way where each um, committee or each topic, each, each article has specific ways that is being presented. So that there's a totally different look and a much more user friendly look. We have managed to, um, every time there's a, a person mentioned, um, we have used, for instance, town moderator, not him or her. Every time we could use the title, we used that as opposed to him or her. So the only real place that comes up is the is the select board, board of selectmen. In my reading of it, other than having to go from one document to the other, um, it's much more cleaner in terms of its presentation in the new one. Yes. 
you had a member of your group, I think you mentioned her name, but I can't remember it, uh, Judy, that went through per herself each line item and rewriting it all. And it does read much better, I will give you that. Uh, I'm only concerned with the, there's a certain expectation and you have your audience and what they expect would be a line item, uh, lining out the sentences and then the new one underneath. But um, in retrospect, I would suggest that would be almost impossible to produce a rational or practical document to show that kind of changes. Right, as you and I discussed, um, the person's name is Holly Van Ness. Holly, yes. And she, in fact, retyped the entire document. Um, and the line item version, which is 69 pages long, is on file in the town clerk's office. And as I say, only somebody who has nothing better to do with their time would, would look at it. Um, other than the last, I think, two weeks of our meetings, every every change in the document had was in that line item version. What we tried to do after we discussed this with town council and the moderator, Madam Moderator, was to make it a presentation that was not overwhelming. If we put 69 of a document, red lines, and then the, the proposed version, no one would pay any attention. I wouldn't pay any attention. So we believed that this presentation of chart one and chart two was the easiest and simplest way for the um, two kinds of changes to be presented to the public. Any comment from anyone? Questions? And I think Judy, uh, the comment presenting a document which may have lined out it line items and then the corrected uh, doc, the, uh, verbiage underneath it, it would be such an intimidating document that it wouldn't be read. Right, and I, the, the point of the whole, one of the charges that the committee gave itself, now known as the group, gave itself was to have a document that was user friendly, that could be understood and that people were not overwhelmed when they went to look at it. I find this to be a very off-putting document with all these bold face things in it. They're not technically part of the charter. The charter is only the specifics. So one of the things was to make the document concise, clear, and comprehensible. And that was why the reformatting was a very important portion and a very time-consuming portion. Any questions, gentlemen? Uh, Judy, yes. is there any reason that we could not put this off until spring town meeting? Yes. It's, uh, it should have been heard in the spring town meeting. Um, there are things that are going to, it's going to take several months for the attorney general's office to go through these changes. Um, I don't believe that we should put off things that, well, first of all, you know, making the document more user friendly is totally appropriate at this time. Um, absent well, I, COVID, I, I, I agree with everything you're saying there. I, I, I think we need to, ch I know we need to change it, need to upgrade it, which you've done, put a lot of work in to get it there. I'm just concerned that at a, at an abbreviated fall town meeting, people may not give it the the attention that it needs and reject it for the wrong reasons. I suppose that's a valid concern, David. Um, on the other hand, the people who have worked for several hundred people hours um, would strenuously object to postponing this um, because there is a lot of work that's gone into it. I think there are really only a couple of what I would call substantive issues that are gonna cause discussion. Um, and I outlined those in the explanation section for you um, on your committee, Bernie. So no, I think that putting it off would be a huge mistake. Um, and 
there was a lot of criticism of the Board of Selectmen for not appointing the committee in January of 2019 when it should have been appointed so that it would have had a year to work on it. The first meeting was actually November 4th. So I, I just think that it would be a very unfortunate thing to postpone this. Furthermore, it's actually been online almost for three weeks. All of the finished documents have been on the town clerk's website, they've been on the charter website, and they've been in the news, the, on the, you know, the news flash on the town website. Um, all of our meetings were posted. Um, you know, they, in terms of advising the public, we have made more information available more quickly than any other, with the possible exception of where village one was rezoning, of any other article that's coming before this meeting. Now, Judy, I'm going to ask you to go out on a limb here. Yep. Have I received the last copy of changes from Cassandra on your charts? <laughs> yes. And the only, yes. I double checked. It's a good question, Bernie. Um, the one that I had last night didn't have the word um, news, recommend getting rid of the term uh, local newspaper or newspaper because we have changed that over to be media. Um, there was one other Scrivener's error. I went back on the website. I went to the town clerk's office. Everything that's been on file for almost three weeks is proper did not need to be corrected. This document, you know, don't ask me because I'm really not all that techy. I don't know how those mistakes got in there. There were two. It happens when you have several people trying to do the right thing. The only reason I ask, of course, is going to appear in our, our report. Yes, I understand that, sir. And, and the, it, the document that you got from um, Marie yes. this afternoon, probably around three o'clock, maybe, Yes. That is, uh, that is it. I double checked it. I triple checked <laughs> it. I can, I can recite it by heart now. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Are any other questions or concerns regarding this issue? Nope, I see there's none. Thank you very much, Judy. You're welcome. Okay, gentlemen, excuse me, that was my cat. Um, we have, as far as we know, these uh, issues that we reviewed this evening that we haven't had votes on yet. Um, one was uh, Article 14, which is the Harbor Services Appropriation. Uh, does anybody have any questions or concern regarding that? Would be any objections to taking a vote this evening? No, I, think we, I think we need a safe boat. We need for the Harbor Masters and obviously they do a great job around town. We, we need to keep them operating as best possible. So I will second the motion to approve it. Okay, who made the motion to begin with? I did. Jody. Did, did, okay. Okay, on the motion, all those in favor? Uh, Jerry, we please. Bernie. Aye. Yes. Dave. Luke. Dave. Yes. Stewart. Yes. Jody. Yes. Glenn. Yes. And Tom, you there? I, I don't know. Is it... He's got himself on mute. And myself, yes. So we got uh, six. Six zero zero. <clears throat> okay, on the uh, village rezoning, Wareham Village One. Any opinions? Anyone uh, want to voice anything? Okay, I'll entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Hey, Stewart's motion approved. Do I have a second, please? Second. 
David seconds. Okay. Um, we'll vote. Gary, would you hey. make roll? Bernie? Yes. Dave? Yes. Stuart? Yes. Jody? Yes. Glenn? Yes. Myself? Yes. Six zero zero. Thank you. Um, okay, we have the uh, WPC Republican Fund. May I have a motion to approve, please? I'll so make a motion to approve. That's Davis. Second. Second. May I have a second, please? Second. Stuart? Jerry, please call the roll. Bernie? Yes. Dave? Yes. Stuart? Yes. Jody? Yes. Glenn? Yes. Myself, yes. Six zero zero. Uh, would anyone be interested in writing the recommendation on that particular article? Any volunteers? Get away, get around the stampede. <laughs> okay, move on to the charter. chart two. This would be the uh, more the language versus the punctuation. Any questions or concerns? What Judy's still here? Motion to recommend. Judy recommends. May I have a second, please? Second. I'll second it. Okay. Okay. Bernie. Yes, call the roll. Bernie Jack. Dave? Yes. Stewart? Yes. Jody? Yes. Glenn? Yes. Myself? Yes. Six zero zero. Now, do we have any uh, questions regarding the recycling fee? Let's see, we've already approved uh, the accounting. But we have no um, no information, financial information regarding a fee. So why don't we pass on that and we'll see perhaps we have some information. Uh, we have one more uh, meeting before we have to put this uh, to the printer. Next one is Article 25, which is the uh, NIP bottles. We have a motion to approve, please. I'm sorry, which number, what is, what are, Article 25, bottles. which is the, the ban the NIP bottles. I move approval. Stewart's approved, may I have a motion to move second? David second. Okay, on the motion. Jerry, please go. Bernie. Yes. Dave? Yes. Stewart? Yes. Jody? No. Glenn? Yes. Myself, no. Four, two, zero. Now on the bottom of the uh, printout that I gave you it has our votes on it. There is the different sections of chart two. Is there any interest in going through each one? Now we've already approved uh, chart two of zero to zero. Is there any one of them though that you may have second thoughts on? And instead of approving chart two unanimously, we can go one by one. What is your interest, gentlemen? Uh, I'm happy the way they are. I I am also. What did you say again, Jody? I'm happy. Pardon? Happy the way they are. The what? The yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm good too, Bernie. Okay, so uh, it's my understanding that that the six zero zero for chart two is inclusive of everything, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Excellent. I believe um, we have nothing on the union contracts yet, and. Yeah. Consider it can be uh, voting on everything we have of information, and that is. Uh, 
even the uh, year to year closeout isn't complete yet. The school, I believe, has completed, but Judy has been unable to complete it as yet, and they're waiting for, or I think they're waiting for the OR to finish its, its uh, checking of it so they can certify free cash and the like. I have approximately um, two thirds of three thirds of the is uh, completed. The uh, cover is going to be some old pics of Main Street and uh, the Historical Society. Eugene has been very generous in uh, researching that. She sent me well, a half a dozen prints that go way back. And some of the buildings are still there, as a matter of fact. In fact, one or two were standalone at the time. And now, of course, there's just one solid line of buildings. But that will be all in the report as an explanation of each also, historical explanation. So that's very interesting. Uh, is there anything else you gentlemen would like for the next meeting? Any information you want on any issue? Well, the two lanes, yes. I know last week you talked about if there were any concerns with the EPA as far as that wire and land that those two gifts is there. I know you sent the maps out today for the oh, gift I, of land. Uh, yes. Oh, by, uh, yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, coincidentally, uh, Alan and Sandy has, um, from conservation has walked those two lots. I was down there yesterday and one is if it has sufficient water or heavy rainfall, it's a pond. Lacking that, it's a marsh for the most part. And that's the uh, perch pond. And that's exactly what it is, is a pond. And uh, private uh, lots abut it 360 degrees. So it's, uh, it's not even accessible, it's almost landlocked. But then again, all the lots are not built on. As far as the second one, the 50 Pond Street, that lot is the current state unaccessible only because the last lot built on Pond Street is actually serves as Pond Street and the gentleman's driveway. And I had to turn around and, and there was about heavily treed in brush, two more lots on paper, anyway, show two more lots to get to 50 Pond. There is no Pond Street going past it. It's on paper, totally. I'm not sure as to the value it would be to the town to take these pieces of the property. As I say, one, whether or not it's buildable. Alan, did you or Sandy actually walk to where that might be located? Yeah, we were visiting at both places. I mean, we didn't see we didn't see any, there's no, there's no value to the town on either property. It's just a matter of whether or not, you know, the town if it decides to take it by tax title somewhere down the line, there's a cost that way. Right now there's no cost either way. You know, just the way it sits, it's not buildable either one of them. There's really no way to make use of them at all. But uh, the, we've ordered last night uh, and I think the vote on both was basically 410. I uh, voted no to take either one of them because I didn't see any value in the town at this time. My immediate so, uh, reaction on town taking taking a property, my first thought was, oh, yeah, let's go. That's a good idea. But as Stuart pointed out, um, if there's no advantage to the town and there may be a liability someplace, maybe not from an EPA point of view, but you know, if the neighbors start complaining that it's not kept up or people get start dumping stuff there or whatever, oh. um, I'm concerned about taking property. I, I would prefer to see it go to the neighbors so they can take care of it. Um, doesn't seem to be any advantage to the town to take it. The, uh, the Illicom Trust for the uh, selectmen voted 3-2-0. And as uh, Alan and I have pointed out, it's a pond and private property abuts it all the way around. Yeah. There is no street access. And the only issue is, is we, we would all agree, it has no value to the town. However, it will cause an expense if we take it as abandoned property. And John Foster said it tossed, it'll cost two to 3,000 to go that route. Why do we have to do that? I'm not sure of the remaining permits. I'm not sure if you just sit there 
the way it is. Right now, it come, becomes uh, our property at no expense. Uh, the problem is, I imagine our insurance policies cover it, but if there's private property all around the pond and there's a boating accident or somebody drowns, why do we want to have anything to do with this? And those are valid concerns, indeed. Alan? Uh, this will probably be a little bit out of subject, but uh, Sandy's uh, family owned, if you go down by Narrows Road and Sandwich Road, where that V is, there's a pond right there in front that goes up, the land goes up the hill. Her family owned uh, the property going up that hill for like three houses. Uh, their grandparents' house was the first one on the hill and the pond was in front there. Uh, the pond was actually owned by the hospital of all people. And uh, they basically gave it to us for a dollar because they didn't want the responsibility of someone falling in and drowning or whatever else. Uh, so we took it. To sell the property, it became a liability because there is a liability to that pond. Yeah. Any other concerns, gentlemen? Okay. On the issue of. Okay, I, I will make I will make a motion to accept the property. Yeah, keep in mind that we have to have a, mo a positive motion. It's how we vote that denotes what we would want to do. Okay. I, I second the motion. Okay, uh, motions are made and seconded on the Illicon Trust. Jerry, can you call the roll, please? Bernie. No. Dave. No. Stewart. No. Jody. No. Glenn. No. Myself, no. Zero six zero. On the Volpe estate. May I have a motion to approve, please? I move to approve it. All right, Stewart's moved. May I have a second? Second. Motion's made and seconded. Jerry, we call the roll, please. Bernie. No. Dave. No. Stewart. No. Jody? No. Glenn? No. Myself? No. Zero six zero. Okay, thank you very much. The only thing we have left is Article 1, 2, and 3, and Article 5, which is uh, bar bills, transfer cash, and 5 is the union contracts. Uh, of course, the recycling fee, we have that one also, but that's for lack of information as the others are. And that I believe is all we have. I will be tomorrow or the next day, ship you off copies of the um, FinCom report as, we current, as it currently stands and be open to your suggestions, recommendations and advice. Yeah, I appreciate if you have any of the uh, recommendations. Uh, Stuart, I think, and Jody has the uh, copy that you have done. Thank you very much. And anything else? Claire, you've been very quiet all evening. Mm -hmm. You want to put your two cents in before we uh, share? No, I'm, I'm going to go in and try to meet with Derek again tomorrow. Um, I have talked with Steve Ruiz. I've talked with Matt Underhill. You know, no matter what we decide or where we decide to have town meeting, there's pluses and minuses to every every option. So I think at this point, we're just going to have to wait and see what happens with uh, COVID. And if there's an upswing, then I still, under the legislation, have the power to recess town meeting for 30 days. Um, so it's it's just right now a holding game to see. Um, and I'm waiting, also waiting for the Board of Health to get back to me, so. Well, less than 30 days, uh, you'll be working <laughs> because I'm in Florida. <laughs> so yeah, David, it, it's, perhaps um, you should wish for 30 days. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, other moderators are in the same position. They're not knowing what to do with the upswing with their meetings. Um, most of them had them late summer, so they were able to have them outside. 
And so they're not having a fall town meeting because they had them uh, in August. So, I, you know, I think by the beginning of next week, we'll have to make a good plan. But it's just right now, let's wait and see with the kids back in school what's going to happen. Now, how flexible is their charter that allowed them to have it uh, so early? It, it was under the legislation that um, we wrote back in March that the moderators had the opportunity and the power to recess the town meeting by doing a declaration uh, to the attorney general's office and the moderators could continue to postpone them for 30 days at a time so if they started out in april and they still weren't comfortable they could recess it till may then they could go to june then they could go to july then they could go to august <clears throat> the only requirement is they <laughs> excuse me have to have the meeting after the governor declares the emergency over town meeting has to happen within 30 days of that so you can postpone it in 30 day increments and that's what they've been doing but they were postponing their spring town meeting same as huge as postponed ours but now we have this charter required fall town meeting in addition to a spring town meeting so a lot of perhaps other towns don't aren't required to have two annual meetings and just call the intervening one the special yeah, some of them don't. Um, and that actually came up today. Um, that was one of the questions was how many towns have a fall town meeting. Um, quite a few of them don't. Um, and so they just have the one in the spring. And then if they need to do something, they do call a special. But um, it's a mix. And, and that's the difficult thing with being a moderator. There's no standard. Every town is different based on their bylaws and charters. So, you know, what would work for us may not work for Rochester or Marion or Freetown based on their charter. So, although we, you know, try to offer each other suggestions, it just depends on what the charter and bylaw in your town will allow you to do. Yeah, I, I grew up, so to speak, in a town that had only one annual and was well, Stoughton, Jody knows. And we just had the fall town meeting, which was, we typically would have one, but it was always a special because that was the time frame that uh, those issues required. But okay, keep us posted, please. I will. I'll let you know. Thank you. And thank you, gentlemen. Um, take a motion to adjourn. So made. Motion's made and seconded. Have to. All those in favor say aye. 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 Very good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.